Happy Easter. If you've got your Bibles, turn me to um, Revelation chapter 5, please. And uh, we're going to preach on the book of Revelation. I don't know if any of you have watched the movie Inception. Have you watched Inception? I walked out of Inception because I didn't understand it. So I said to my kids last night, I didn't understand Inception. They said, oh, Dad, you're so doof. I said, well, or you explain it to me. He said, oh, it's very simple. It's a, it's a dream that goes into another dream that goes into another dream that goes into another dream. And in that dream, you get the code that unlocks the other dream. And I said, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Revelation is like that. So if you don't understand it, Thomas, I'll explain it to you today. <laughs> Seeing you called me doff in front of everybody last night and Nasia. Yo, Dad, you don't understand Inception. I'm going to explain Revelation to you today. Or would you like to explain it? Okay, I'll explain it. Okay, I'll do what I do. You do what you do. So, so Revelation is like a dream within a dream, within a dream, within a dream, within a dream. And if we can confuse Genesis, which is what the devil does, and we can confuse Revelation, everybody thinks, well, if we can't get the beginning right or the end right, then the middle doesn't make sense. No, the, end, the beginning and the end make perfect sense, and the whole book makes amazing sense. So we're going we're gonna to read about Jesus today from the book of Revelation. It's a dream within a dream, and, and you can't actually draw the picture that it draws because it's, a, it's an apocalypse. It's a, he's seeing things, and he sees seven horns. And when he sees seven horns, you don't want to actually try and draw seven horns on a sheep because it doesn't really match, but, but what he means is perfect authority. And I want to tell you, friends, that Jesus has not lost control of this country or of this world. And Easter Sunday is a day just to remind us he is perfectly in control. His seven horns are still on his head. He's still in the center of the throne. And he is busy unpacking the redemptive nature of history. Amen. So let's have a look. Revelation 5. It will come up on the board for those who don't have their Bibles. And... uh, if you don't understand it, my two children will explain it to you. It's, 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 it's like inception. Then I saw in the right hand of him, John has gone up to heaven, and uh, he's seen the throne of God. And around the throne, there's a lion, and there's an ox. I said, I said if I had said this to you, Ret she cho ditswe, would you know what I meant? Would you know if I let me say it again? Red she ge for ditswe. If I said to you Jacobus Petrus Durant, would you know what I'm talking about? You would have no idea. But if I said to you Os Durant, you say, Oh, oh my kin, an oxen che, uh huh, red she fe who fatse ox. Around the throne is a lion. And an ox. So strong is that? So stats is that? Horse. So, so they take the strongest guy on the team and they call him? Horse. Yeah, exactly. They got it from Revelation. <laughs> you think you got it from the farm, eh? They got it from Revelation. So you've got these four, and, and you've got a man and you've got an eagle around the throne. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a skull with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll? He's talking about the history of the world. Who is worthy to open it and to explain it to us and to show us how it's going to end? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth, layers of inception. Is he the lion of Judah? Is he the root of David? Or is he the lamb? And many people think, friends, that when Jesus came, he was going to come as this roaring lion that was going to put all sorts of authority in place 
And he does come as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But the last revelation of Jesus to the world is one of a lamb. And what we are trying to do is we are trying to establish worldly leadership principles, and we have very big guys with big personalities filling pulpits and using their personalities to try and win people over. We'll never win people over with sheer personality, not with force, not with strength, but with lamb, meekness. There's a replacing that takes place. The lamb. And people say to me, the lion, the lamb will become the lion. Not in the Bible. In the Bible, the lion becomes the lamb. And that we celebrate on Easter Sunday. Looking in the middle, in the middle, in the middle, looks like a lamb that has been slain standing. Say standing. standing. Stephen alluded to this on Good Friday. But the whole of the Bible can be traced through the picture of the Lamb. You can put it up on the board. I won't try and look at the notes. But in Genesis, one Lamb replaces one man. Isaac goes on to the altar. They're about to slay Isaac. It's a picture of Jesus. And God says, no, don't slay your son. There's a ram in the thicket. One man, one Lamb. In the book of Exodus... It says you must take one lamb per family and you must take the blood of the lamb and you must put it on the doorpost. And when I pass over, say Passover, yes. so to be celebrating, when I pass over, when I see the blood, I won't judge you, I'll pass over. Now you imagine every firstborn child in Egypt is going to get killed because God is putting revenge upon them. But they put blood on the doorpost and you're staying in a set of townhouses and the avenging angel comes and the firstborn child gets killed and they start shouting, yeah! and the next one, yeah! and you're looking at your firstborn child and you've got blood on the doorpost and you put all your faith in the blood and you're looking at your firstborn child and you feel God coming closer. He goes, he passes over. And every one of us, friends, today live in the absolute relief that God should judge us because we are sinners, bad sinners, dark sinners. We've all sinned. He passes over us and we live with this deep relief on Easter Sunday that Jesus Christ can save our sins. In Leviticus chapter 16, one lamb for every nation. Where they put, it's called Azazel. They put all the sins onto one lamb. And they send the lamb into the wilderness called a scapegoat. They send it into the wilderness and all the sins of one whole nation go into the wilderness. In Isaiah 53, friends, it's one lamb for the sins of many. Ever increasing, friends, this lamb that's in the center of the throne. Ever increasing until it reaches you and me. Isaiah 53 says he was beaten beyond human recognition. He was beaten beyond human recognition. This is not a place where we just come and eat Easter eggs. This is a place where there was a deep price for your freedom and for my freedom. It says he was bruised. Say bruised. He was bruised for my iniquities. Last Good Friday, last year, I preached about all the places where Jesus bled. But one of the greatest places that Jesus bled was internally. He bruised himself. Friends, people are sitting here today. You don't know how to get to the depths of your pain. You don't know how to get to the depths of your rejection. Is that true, Christopher? I met Christopher today. I met Christopher through a friend that I planted a church in White River because I went on a rugby tour when I was an 18-year-old boy, and God told me to start a church before I was a Christian. And somebody got saved in that church, and he told me to meet Christopher. And so today I went to pick up Christopher. How are you, Christopher? I've spent many days, Rory, in Swarbrick Clinic under psychiatric care because I got abused by my father. You see, he was bruised, and the only way, friends, that bruising can ever heal is when bruising gets absorbed into your bloodstream. And when it gets absorbed into your bloodstream, it starts to flow through all the organs where you have been deeply wounded. I cannot get to the depths of the pain in your heart. But Easter Sunday, the blood that was internally shed, not just the blood outside that can cover your head and all the things that your eyes have seen, and all the things that your mouth have said as the blood starts to drip over and just punch it in his side and his, everything your hands have touched and everywhere where your feet have been, they shouldn't have been, the blood of Christ starts to drip and drips over your sexual organs when you've done things that you shouldn't have done and it starts to drip into the very thorns and thistles that are surrounding you and the garden starts to come back and we start to see a little bit of heaven established on earth. 
We start to speak properly to each other. We start to forgive. We start to act gently. We start to act like lambs, not just lions. When people come into our presence, they should feel safe and gentle and kind and generous. Amen? And he's allowed the blood to get deep in, hey, Christopher? Deep into your heart, deep into your heart, deep into your heart to heal. And I started to preach the blood and I started to lead people to Christ. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of many. Isaiah 53, John chapter 1. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the? Say it. Genesis, one lamb, one man. Exodus, one lamb, one family. Leviticus, one lamb, one nation. Isaiah chapter 53, one lamb for the sins of many. John chapter 1, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the? Say it. The whole wide world, including yours. Yeah. Acts chapter 8 is an incredible scripture. Is an Ethiopian eunuch. Excuse me, friends, for those who have been here. An Ethiopian eunuch was a man whose genitals had been crushed and cut off. He had nowhere to go. He couldn't produce a family. He was deeply wounded. He would have been ripped off at school. He would have had a feminine body because he would have had no testosterone in his body. And he goes to Jerusalem to try and get healed and he doesn't get healed. And he's walking away from Jerusalem. He's got money. He's the financial minister of a whole nation. He's got money and he sits down on the side of the road and he's reading Isaiah 53. And it says that like a lamb led to a slaughter, he remains silent. And he's completely crushed. He's completely cut off. And a man comes and stands and says, can you help me? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about somebody else? He says, starting with that very scripture, starting with the scripture of the Lamb, he led him to the place where Isaiah 56 says, and to the Ethiop, to the eunuchs, I will give a name better than sons and daughters. And all of a sudden he realized that all the cutting and the crushing that has taken place in his life and all the cutting and the crushing that has taken place in your life. Good girl. So good. There is nothing. It's called your private parts. It's called your private, that's why we call it our private parts. It's called the family jewels. And when it gets crushed and broken, the things that are dear to you, the private things in your life, the expensive things, the important things, when those things get crushed and cut, where do you go? You go to the lamb who looks like he's slain, but he's standing up. And he should have been fallen down, but he's standing up at the center of the throne. Drip, drip, drip drip into every part of your body. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 17 and 18, I'm a pastor. I've been doing this for 30 years. The greatest thing I deal with is people's pasts. And they walk into my room and they say, you don't know what I've been through. And it says this in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 17 and 18. It is not with silver or gold that I've been redeemed. Say redeemed. redeemed. It is not with silver or gold. You can't pay for your redemption, friends. I've been around lots of rich people. You can buy a bigger car, you can buy a bigger house, you can buy more golf clubs, but you can't pay for your redemption. You can't make that thing that's inside of you go away with money. You can throw money at it, you can go on holiday, you can lie on the beach, you can buy new clothes, you can do everything, but you cannot pay for that depth and, and that pain that is deep inside there. It is not with silver or gold that you've been redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers, but by the precious blood, say the blood, the precious blood of the Lamb who was chosen before the foundations of the earth. I was born in 1968, the day that I got born again. My bloodline from 68 was interrupted by the bloodline of heaven, and whatever my parents have given me, bad, gets broken. I am not, friends, subject to my history because God broke the power of the pain of my life. And so we don't have to keep cycling brokenness or rejection or hurt or psychological dis. We don't have to keep cycling it. And we see this thing. 75% of alcoholics' children become alcoholics. Why? Because that thing is so powerful. But when Jesus comes, he breaks it. Amen? Amen? And then Revelation chapter 5, he's at the center of the throne. One lamb, one man, one lamb, one family, one lamb, one nation, 
One lamb for the sins of many. One lamb for the sins of the whole world. One lamb for every person who's cut and crushed. One lamb for every historical thing that you've ever been through. One lamb at the center. And if you read Revelation, the whole of eternity is going to be with the lamb. Good morning. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Say the lamb. The lamb. The lamb. Say, Rory, what chance has South Africa got? The lamb. We don't need lions to be standing in pulpits. We need lambs. We need gentlemen. We need kind men. We need men who understand the blood. Men who will sing the songs of the lamb. Each one had a harp. What's your picture of heaven? Like, oh, on a cloud eating grapes. That's why I don't want to go to heaven. I don't like harps, and I don't like clouds. And I don't want to be fat in heaven. I want to be thin. It's like a big fat cherub eating grapes with a harp. You think, oh, there's going to be harps in heaven. Oh. For any of you that are over 50, if you can put up Psalm 137 for me, please. For any of you that are over 50, let me, let's read this. Any of you are over 50, let's read it. Come on, read it. Yeah, you see. Uh, no, you can't read it like it. It's like, by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down. Let's go. Hey, hey, we wept. When? When we remembered Zion, look at the next it says, there on the poplars we hung our harps. That was like an electric guitar, Tana. That wasn't like some, that was like the instrument of the time. And then it says, and then I can't remember, it says, and then the wicked made us captive. It says, how can we sing the Lord's song in a... In a strange land. You can't sing the Lord's song in a strange land. This is what Psalm 126 says. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. You, you know what that word, like men who dreamed? We were restored to full health. Friends, Easter Sunday is reminding us that we can actually start to live in victory even here. Even here. Let the electric guitar go. Heaven's going to be a jewel. A harp is not an old age instrument. It is an electric guitar with a DJ. We're going to have a jewel worshiping the lamb with us. And they sang a new song. They sang a new song. You're worthy to take the scroll. And to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you have purchased men for God. From every nation, tribe, and tongue. You think songwriters are clever. They just copy the Bible. <laughs> By the rivers of Boney M made millions from that. They should pay the church. <laughs> from every tribe... And language, and people, and nation. Say every tribe. Every tribe. And, language, and language, and people, people. and nation. nation. Friends, let, let me just tell you about the second row. I'll just tell you about the second row. Last Peter, sir, in Engelbrecht, and he saw his cock. It's my Mikey's. But I'll come from another place, not from the church, not from the school. Let me tell you about this man. Our whole series, I don't want to embarrass you, Greg. Our whole series, friends, on anything can happen. It was a nine-month series that we preached in this church where we saw miracles. I want to tell you miracles, Greg. We saw miracles in this church. You can see this church has exploded in numbers. It's full outside. We saw miracles because when you came to church last Sunday, last Easter Sunday, the following Sunday we started a series called Anything Can Happen, Even Greg Miller Can Come to Church. I want to honor you. You are the greatest talent scout I've ever met in my life. I've never seen you believe in people and seen skill in people, just like Jesus sees skill in people. And I've never seen you sacrifice so much for young boys to see their full potential coming. That's what Jesus does. 
And it was a man like you who took me on a rugby tour. And on that rugby tour, God spoke to me. I wasn't even saved and told me to plant a church. And I planted a church. And so God says, I'm going to send you a black family today from every nation and tribe and tongue on Easter Sunday. You know why I met him? COVID hit. He's a big shot at Standard Bank in Africa. I'm not a businessman. But I've got a friend who's got a church it was overlooking the fields of a field in Durban, and we weren't allowed to watch. So I said to my one mate, listen, I've got a mate who's got a church. We're going to stand on the veranda and watch the rugby. And he says, I've got another mate called SJ. Can I bring him with? He said, yeah. And we met. We said, how's it? And, and, and I never knew we'd spend Easter together. But from every nation and tribe and tongue, God is going to start to put a family together that worships him. He's going to take a black guy from White River from a rugby tour. He's going to take a rugby coach who believes in talent and invests in people you know who that is? That's my oldest cousin. She's actually not our original oldest cousin. Our original oldest cousin was a guy called Guy. He had cerebral palsy. And we learned about cerebral palsy. This week he played golf with a guy who's got cerebral palsy. We've got a family in our church who started a school for children who got cerebral palsy. I love that little boy. He just comes and he hugs me. He's close to me. Why? Because God told us many years ago, you're going to have some boys in your, school, in your church. They're going to have cerebral palsy, and you're going to have to love them. And so I'm going to give you a cousin, and I'm going to put him in your family. And then, and then I'm going to actually, and then I'm going to give you a granny who prays. And most of my cousins are serving Jesus because we had a granny who prayed. And now she's my oldest cousin because God went to be with God. Our church is now full of young people who have got cerebral palsy. And God sent my cousin, and she brought her friends. And, and from every nation, tribe, and tongue, God can start putting people together to worship Him. Yes or no? Why are you here this morning? I'll tell you why you're here. Because of the Lamb. Because of the Lamb. You think, I don't feel comfortable with the loud music. I didn't like Inception. <laughs> can I tell you about Peterson? Peterson... Peter saw I met on the side of a rugby field. Actually, we met in Folksrust. Where? What's that place called? The town? Freyheit. I bought, came up in my car. I'd given my car away. I was walking. I hired a car. We went to Freyheit. I went through all the potholes. I got out there, and, and, the, and the, the boys around said, Hello, my name is Rory Dyer. They said, It's Peter. I said, Hello, we're going to my mat. We became friends there. And then he came to listen to me preach in Belito. And Peter said, I like that thing about how you Oaks built that building in the middle of COVID. So he sent it to Engelbrecht. That's Engelbrecht. <laughs> so Peter sent it to Engelbrecht, and Engelbrecht gave it to a guy called Wally. And Wally was coming up here, and he didn't think God could use an English oak in Pretoria. And his knee was bad. So he put his hand on his knee, and he said, God, if you can give money to an English oak in Pretoria, you can heal my knee. And God healed his knee. So he phoned Engelbrecht, and he said, Engelbrecht, phone Peterson and get the number from that other oak from Belito to come here, because, because I, I, I need Engelbrecht and Peterson and Cock and, and, and my cousin and, and the black oak from White River, because there's going to be a group of people, every nation, tribe, and tongue, and it's even going to include rugby coaches, and we're all going to worship the lamb together. Not with like a harp. With like electric guitar. And a ch 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 You with me? Why are you here? Why are you here? Because God has taken every nation, tribe, and tongue as a testimony of how he builds the church. Amen? Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb. Sing it with me. Mm -hmm. I'm still busy with you Afrikaners. Kok Pieterse in Engelbrecht. In a late stem. Say in a loud voice. They said, worthy is the Lamb. That's not what heaven's going to be like. Let's say it in a loud voice. In a loud voice they said, worthy is the Lamb. 
let's, let's just do it one more time in a loud voice. In a loud voice, they said, Worthy is the Lamb. One Lamb, one man. One Lamb, one family. One Lamb, one nation. One Lamb for the sins of many. One Lamb for the sins of the whole world. One Lamb for the crushed and the broken. One Lamb for those who are historically one Lamb at the center of your life will start to bring order into every part of your life. And they shouted, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that was in them singing, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, say to the Lamb, be praise and glory and honor and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and they worshiped. Friends, I want to speak about those eight things and we finished. Number one, Jesus is worthy of power because he was defeated and everybody thought he was unbelievably foolish and he was unbelievably weak. And everybody said when he goes to the cross, it's all over. Everything is over. He completely bamboozled them. He said the power is not going to come from some mighty guy with atomic bombs that blow up the enemy. The power is going to come with deep humility and weakness underneath. And the church is not meant to be built on the personalities of great preachers. The church is meant to be built on the humility of Christ. And he is worthy of power because he gave his power away. And friends, there's something in the, in, the, in the Easter Sunday that's called the divine exchange. That everything that you are, he became. So that everything that he is, you can become. Some of you have got weak will. Some of you have got weak temper. Some of you have got weak patience. And Jesus weakened himself completely so that he could empower you. And so we have no excuse on an Easter Sunday you know, friends, when, 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 when Jesus purchased men for God, in the, in the tomb which is open, Mary goes and Mary is this beautiful Mary Magdalene, clean from seven spirits. She was demonized. She was in the psychiatric hospital. She was an absolute loony nutcase. And Jesus decided he's going to start his ministry on Mary the nutcase. If I started my ministry, I would start my ministry with somebody who's got a PhD degree, who's a man, because women had no standing in that place, a man who possibly played rugby for the Springboks, who's got a PhD in the doctrine and theology. I would start my ministry on that, and Jesus says, I'm going to start with a woman who's got absolutely no standing in society, who everybody thinks she's a nutcase. I'm going to use her to start my ministry. That's what he says. And then it says this to the elders of this church. It's a scripture that absolutely frightens me. It says, to the shepherds amongst you, shepherd my people that I have purchased with my blood. You know what the most expensive thing on this property today is? It's not the building. It's not your car in the car park. The most expensive thing on this property today is you. You. You've been purchased with his blood. And so when I speak about you or speak to you, I must speak gently because you're an expensive item. You are highly treasured and valued by God. I cannot throw around my opinion of you because it's great price that's gone to you, great sacrifice into your life. And all of a sudden, Engelbrecht and Peter Sir and Cork and my cousins. And the black guy that I met from White River and the rugby coach, we all start to understand we're pretty valuable to God. We're pretty expensive. You know, Mary doesn't recognize Jesus. He doesn't call her Mary Magdalene, the woman who got delivered from seven demons. He doesn't call her Rory the robber or Barant the Bliximer. He just turns on and he says, Mary, Mary. Nasia, Nasia, Thomas, Greg, Melanie, Christopher. That's Easter Sunday. That's how the church started. Don't. Ma Ma Mary, not, not, don't remind me of my past, Lord. You died so that I didn't have to have a past. You died so that I could be free from my past. 
Seven quick things. He became weak so that I could be, have power. He became poor, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Although he was rich, for our sakes he became poor, so that through him we might be rich. Friends, he's worthy of our wealth because he became poor. I believe poverty is a curse. I don't believe in the prosperity gospel. I don't think pastors should be rich. But I don't think poverty should rule. And poverty will not be fixed by the economies of our government or by the finance ministers because people are too greedy. And they've got people that have got these massive dams and they've never ever let water out of the dam because they love to trust the dam wall. We have a source and we have a mission and God will always pour through us. There will always be enough wealth to do what God has called us to do. He is worthy of power and wealth and wisdom. The cross was foolishness and strength and honor. Say honor. honor. The opposite of honor is disgrace. Many people have disgraced themselves. And Jesus became a disgrace so that you and I could have honor again. Somebody came to me a couple of weeks ago and said, Oscar's coming out of jail. Would he be welcomed in your church? I said, if you really knew this church and you knew my own heart, most of us have done much worse things than Oscar. You don't know how to respond or recover from your disgrace. Jesus came, became a disgrace for you so you can live with honor again. You know, my dad had a funny saying with me. He used to say to me when I was a little boy, he said to me, shake a man's hand, squeeze it as hard as you can, and look in the back of his pupils. So even now, when I shake Oak's hands, I can hear their knuckles crunching. I'm so sorry. It's just a bad habit that I learned. But it doesn't matter. Why don't you stand, boy? It doesn't matter how, how you, you stand, but... but no, really, hey. Hey, 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 anything can happen. But, but, but now I crunch, and, and, I, and, I, and I look deep into the back of his pupils, and I'm thinking, and you think, why are you doing this? Because my old man was standing behind me. We went to an auction this week of a man who's one of our friends who's got no dad. He's lived with absolute disgrace, lived with absolute poverty, grew up in the township, he's got nothing, but he went to an auction and he decided on a price, and so we as an eldership decided on how much money we can put down as a deposit. And I stood behind him, and as the bidding started, friends, as the bidding started, it was the price that he had decided was the final price. And he looked around at me and I thought, stick your hand out, crunch their knuckles, and look in the back of their pupils, China. Because he came in weakness and gave me power. He came in disgrace and gave me honor. I can sit in any room, friends, and look at any man in the eye. He came in weakness and gave me strength. Twenty times he looked behind me. Twenty times he looked behind me. We won the auction. And he said, now what are we going to do with the deposit? I said, I don't know phoned a few of my friends because God has made a church from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Some rich folks, some black folks, some white folks, some Afrikaans folks, some bankers. And we put the deposit together and we put the deposit down and, and, and then we take the kingdom of God and, and it's a little Enghia church in an area that's gone black and all Afrikaans guys have left and the black guys are there and now we've bought a little piece of property and we're going to trust that heaven's going to come down and the blood of the lamb is going to start to spill and people are going to start getting healed. And honor and glory. How many of you got shame? I met with a man this week, got abused by his maid. He's a big man, strong man, muscular man, long hair. Looks like an absolutely amazing man, but he was abused, carries shame with him. Easter Sunday, Jesus is in the middle of the throne and the blood starts to drip so that that shame doesn't become a noose around his neck and disappear. 
and praise. The opposite of praise is, is curse. I remember Clint was there. We nearly finished. Clint was there. We were in Durban. And we went on the stage as a group of elders. How many of us? 15 of us. Clint. I think Christian, you were there too, eh? Christian was there. We went on the stage. And there was a whole empty auditorium. We had plastic seats. We, we couldn't see anybody. But there was one man. There was one man. Where there was adultery in his family. And he was sitting at the very back of the church on his seat with his head covered by his hands like this. Sitting in the back of the church. And we put our hands out and we started to pray. And I've only seen this two or three times in my life. But the power of God chucked him out of the back of his seat and threw him to the back of the church. And he lay down weeping. We got the fright of our lives. We ran there. And I realized God was taking the curse. And giving him back yes. praise. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Because he dealt with your defeat, your poverty, your foolishness, your weakness, your shame, your disgrace, and your curse and mine too he's at the center of the throne let's worship him say with me in a loud voice worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb. let's pray thank you jesus for every person here i pray this lord god that everyone would leave here in four states loved clean free and whole when we live under the preaching of your word we'll be loved We'll be clean, we'll be free, and we'll be whole. Internal bruising, external pain, sexual, emotional, psychological, moral, Lord God, loved, clean, whole, and free. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, standing at the center of the throne. In Jesus' name.